good morning. It's still morning, just so you know. It's a beautiful day outside. <laughs> and um, I just came in uh, from uh, a meeting, and I think you were running early, so thank God I'm here on time. Otherwise, Maria would have been tap dancing up here for you. The, I feel like Monty Python, you remember. Uh, and now for something completely different. Uh, this is a very different view of the world, the way of looking at the world. And the reason I believe why Maria wanted me to come and speak here is because you're all leaders. You're all organizational leaders. You're all thought leaders. You're all trying to create change and trying to inspire people to come with you for the ride. And for that reason, I think they found that the work that we've done with leaders is something that you'd, be fi you'd find interesting. Since 2008, Scientific Intelligence, uh, we have done a series of mappings with Canadian CEOs. So these are groups of between six and 12 CEOs at a time that we worked with for half-day sessions, developing these maps that pertain to aspects of leadership, that which leaders care about, that which leaders must do. And I'm going to share one of those maps with you that was a seminal map and that helped us to uh, make some important predictions as well. So in the next uh, 20 minutes, we're going to sort of immerse you in that thought process. I don't know whether I am debate or de debunk or delight or demystify, but, uh, but hopefully all those things uh, will happen. And if there are further questions afterwards, happy to answer them. I'll be hanging out for the rest of the day. So I am your device. You are the device. <laughs> yes. And what a brilliant device you are. Thank, Thank you. you, Maria. So I, I'll advance and just Fantastic. OK. So if we can go to the, uh, the first one. So why are we here? So uh, we are here, really, I just told you why we are here. So act actually, we can get to the second one. And that is, what, uh, what did we find? And so we uh, used a process that I'm going to tell you a little bit about, because it discovers something that I think all of you have been utilizing without knowing it. And it's important for you to know what it is consciously and to deliberately leverage these things. And it is something that. This is the phrase from King Lear. The fool says to King Lear in Lear, see better. See what is in front of you. And our job as an organization is to help leaders see better. How do you see better? Well, back in 1976, a, an author that who you probably know now, and by, at that time he was a complete unknown. His name was um, Richard Dawkins. And he is now one of the world's great evolutionary biologists out of England. And he wrote a book, his first bestseller was called The Selfish Gene. And he identified a phenomenon that is very similar to a biological phenomenon, but it's a sociological or mental phenomenon that we use every day. And he said, what is a meme? Meme is an expression, if you go to TED conferences or Idea City, you'll see more speakers talking about this. And they usually relate it to the internet, but the internet was not the origin of the concept of meme. It's based on the Greek word memesis, which means to copy or to replicate. So let's think about it for a moment. Success in biology, if you are a species, equals the degree to which you as a species replicate, disseminate your DNA in a particular ecosystem. Now make the transition, the analogy to your causes, your brands, your organizations, your asks and whether they replicate across a society or within an individual very, very deeply. So he started with this very simple definition of a gene and gave us a huge insight. He said, what is a gene? Go to the next one. It's a, a gene is a sequence or system of biological information, basically amino acids. A, C, T, G are the four letters of the DNA alphabet. And so if we arranged it in one particular sequence, it would equal Maria. If we change the sequence slightly, it would equal me. If we changed it further, it would be like that of a chimpanzee. If we changed it further, so DNA sequences equal the organism that results. I want you to sort of really absorb this for a moment. We use the term DNA so frequently in marketing. What does it really mean? DNA means a sequence of information that is absolutely consistent, that copies itself constantly, and that results in the organism that you see and experience. So as marketers, as leaders, when we say, what is the DNA of my brand? What is the DNA of my hospital? We're saying, essentially, what is the sequence of ideas, not amino acids, that constitutes this self-repeating, replicable, disseminatable, if that's a word, set of ideas? 
And what we found was that there is a set of ideas that are memetic, that are associated with leadership. Right, so we're going to show you the leadership meme, so to speak. So the next idea says, memes are essentially what is behind the success of a brand, a success of a technology, a success of any kind of idea, a belief system. Right? So you could say, what was the meme or set of memes that resulted in Obama getting elected in that presidential campaign? Right? He was utilizing a set of ideas that the public found enormously attractive and they wanted to repeat again and again and again. You can see it in their behaviors, how many times, for example, people went to the website and donated. Quite extraordinary. Next. So what we found, I'm going to show you the map now. We can just go right to the map, actually. So using a process that I won't get into now, a mapping process with these CEOs, this was the first map that came out in, uh, was it uh, August of 2007? And we're going to marinate in this for a few minutes, because this is really the point of my presentation, is to show this to you and to get you to intuitively start to absorb it and start to understand it, start to apply it to your, your lives, your professional and personal lives. So a map with our structural, structural mapping process always looks different, but they have certain common features. You can read it like a TTC map. It's a good way to start looking at a map. You have starting points, which are ideas that are like triggers, where the conversation begins that pertains to that statement at the top of the page, which is the desired outcome. Mapping maps against a desired outcome. The question that one of our clients asked us in August of 2007 was, how can I be a better leader? Not just me, but what are the key drivers in society for successful leadership? And this is the map that resulted. So if you read it like a transit map, there are three different starting points where it's almost like these are the neighborhoods where people live. They get on the train and they go to Union Station. And that blue shaded region in the middle is essentially what? A self-replicating, self-perpetuating sequence of ideas. It's an infinite loop. We found that there was an infinite loop associated with successful leadership, which I'll take you to in a minute. But let's start at the outermost points and take the journey. So over here, if you go to the next slide, intuitive anthropologists. These, these words are uh, basically placeholders or suitcases for big ideas. So intuitive anthropologist simply means, in colloquial terms, people skill. So Bill, Bill Clinton, in his first term, was famous for his ability to read people social dynamics, group dynamics, and to utilize them, them to get his point across, right? So people skill is one starting point for successful leadership. So one dimension of successful leadership is obviously the ability to work with human beings and understand them. The next one, childlike genius. That note is really about that incredible sense of optimism and belief. So a lot of our, our leaders of today are representative of this archetype, like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and the Google Boys and Richard Branson, you name it, there's a long list of childlike geniuses that we are inherently attracted to. Keep in mind, however, though, that these starting points are merely starting points. They are the beginning of the journey. They are not the be-all and end-all. On the right, nurturing, kind of the biggest no-brainer of the century. Caring about your constituents is the first, is, is a starting point to successful leadership, right? Being nurturing. And these feed into other ideas, which I'll take you through in a minute. Right? And the next, I want to point your attention to this. Occasionally, when we do a mapping, we reveal, or what's discovered is what's called a dangling meme, which doesn't happen all the time. A dangling meme is like a widow or an orphan. It's a fragment. So it is a meme, meaning it is self-replicating in its nature. But there are no pathways leading into it. It's almost like if, you, uh, if you're gardeners, Gardeners in the room know what a cutting is. So if you take a cutting from a tree, it is not yet viable for at least several weeks until you put it in water and it grows a root system. So think of this as a cutting, meaning non-viable, but very tempting. And one of my colleagues calls it the escalating commitment to a losing course of action <laughs> or a trap door. That's one of the few things I remember from business school. And, and here it is, escalating commitment to a losing course of action. So let's start putting common sense against this map. Okay, so I'm going to take you to the top, intuitive anthropologist, which is understand, childlike genius, which is inspire, nurture, which is take care of me, all feed into a meme, which is the core essence of leadership, and it's expressed in many different ways. 
But underlying, it is the idea, I'm going to take you through it very slowly, of being unencumbered in your thinking, thinking and acting freely, having a new style, meaning being of today, contemporary, relevant of today, then to trust it and trusting, that two-way trust factor, trusting others and having others trust you, and then quiet confidence, being comfortable in your skin, self-awareness and comfort in your skin. And if you really could think about it, all the leaders, most of the leaders that we truly admire, that we find inspiring, have many of these qualities, and they wrap it into a story that is unique to them, but they have common qualities. Right? And then here is the trap door. Long-lasting good taste is just a synonym for popularity. And celebrated is celebrated. It's fame, popularity, fame. So let's think about it for a moment. Our, our client who saw this map, she said once we did it, ah, that's the Carly Fiorina story. We said, what do you mean? She said, Carly Fiorina, when she was CEO of, of HP, was all about the top map, all about childlike genius, intuitive, nurturing, their social innovation, their philanthropy, HP invent, trusted and trusting. She was doing the whole map and then started going on road shows where it became the Carly Fiorina show. Hi, I'm Carly. I'm so cool. Don't you just love me? And essentially fell into the trap door of popularity, fame, popularity, fame. And if you think about it, that is always the temptation. That's why it's a dangling meme. As a leader, or as a brand, or as an organization, going after fame, or going after celebrity, going after popularity, in and of itself, is a trapdoor. Whereas if you look at the top part of the map, it is essentially qualities of service leadership. Seeing better on behalf of your constituents, meaning having a vision. Being trusted and trusting, nurturing them. Being unencumbered in your thinking, service leadership. So the common sense that came through this map was successful leadership is service leadership. Self-aggrandizing leadership is a trapdoor. That's the basic wisdom coming out of this map. So let's take you a little bit further in the time that we have. So if we go to the next one, I think we can keep going. Excellent. So the first slide that comes in should say, so click again, please. So we're going to take you through parts of this map. The importance of being one's own person, meaning unencumbered, being mentally free. So when we are attracted as leaders to things like innovation and creativity, what's behind that? Behind that is a quality. Right? Innovation is not important unto itself, in, except insofar as it demonstrates your ability to be agile and flexible in your thinking. All options are available to you. The moment you box yourself in, you are closing the valve to the meme. Because this is the entry point to the meme, if you notice. Right? Next, freshness counts, new style. So in the 2008 pres US presidential election, it does matter when the clothing, the style, the language, the imagery is out of date. So if you looked at uh, Hillary's styling, so to speak, you'd think that was superficial. It's not at all superficial to the American public. It said yesterday, it said old school, labor union, 1970s politician. It did not say contemporary and relevant of today. And certainly McCain w failed to do that as well. Obama did it brilliantly. So when you see his you know, the, the dais and what it looks like, the logos, the use of YouTube and et cetera. Marshall McLuhan was right. The, the medium is the message. He projected the message that I am of right now, of today, right? as opposed to of yesterday. Very important. Next, trust is a two-way street. So you notice the node there on the lower right says trusted and trusting. Trusted and trusting, meaning, I'll give you a little story about this. Two opposing examples. Al Gore was very famous in Washington for believing that he was smarter than his staff. So he did not listen to them. He did not trust them. And in doing so, I think he lost touch and made a few significant gaffes, such as claiming things that weren't actually true, like I invented the internet. Now, that again broke that trusted and trusting equation. Then compare that to the relatively unknown story of how yes we can and believe change you can believe in were presented to Obama by his staff. So imagine a meeting, a small conference room, and they're presenting these, these options. They've done their homework. And his response actually to yes we can was he said, that sounds like a first grader talking. It's very simplistic. And change we can believe in doesn't make any sense to me. There's change or, there, or believe in us, but what is change we can believe in? His staff basically said, we have a very strong intuition that this will work. 
let us do it. And what did he do? As any good leader should, he said, you know what? I hired you for a reason because you're very good at what you do. Let's give it a try. And if it works, we'll go with it. Trust. Immense. That story, of course, got out in D.C. in political circles that he was someone you would love to work with because he will listen to your ideas. Right? Very powerful. Next. And this, to me, is the most interesting of all of the nodes on this map. And it's the one that requires the most introspection on the part of a leader. Comfortable in one's own skin. Quiet confidence. A few years after we did this map, I talked to a friend of mine who had been a fundraiser for Al Gore and John Kerry and Howard Dean. And I asked him, there's something I never understood. Help me understand why the scream undid Howard Dean's campaign. It was just a scream. It was just a scream. Why, how did that happen? And he actually referenced our map, and he said, the answer's right in front of you. When you're president of the United States with your hand in, within reach of the big red button, you can't be a screamer. You can be kind of dumb. You don't have to have IQ, clearly, to get into the office. And you don't have to be a nice person, but you cannot be a hysteric. And he, through not only that scream, on a number of occasions, projected something that made the American public extremely uncomfortable, and they couldn't put their finger on it. They couldn't put words to it. But quiet confidence is the opposite of being shrill. And another mistake that Hillary made in the campaign at a certain point, because of her tone and manner, she was actually nicknamed Trillery. The moment I heard that from my political friends in the United States, I thought, this is the beginning of the end. She's done. Even though the polls said she had a double-digit lead against any other candidate. Right? But if you understand the American psyche, you cannot scream and you cannot be shrill. You have to, even if we disagree with you, have some kind of solid, quiet confidence. Right? It's a requirement. Next. This is all over the map. IQ versus EQ. If you follow the wonderful work of Daniel Goleman and, and emotional intelligence, he had teams of people doing longitudinal studies of successful leaders. And they, they asked the question, what do successful leaders have in common? Is it gender? No. Is it racial background? No. Is it educational attainment? No. Is it IQ, measurable IQ? Not at all. Nothing they had in common except one thing, which is emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence breaking down into components such as emotional self-awareness, being aware of how you feel. Emotional articulation, being able to articulate how you feel and, and having the willingness to do it. Empathy, being able to feel the feelings of others. And last but not least, social judgment, being able to operate with people in a skillful manner, all of which are component parts of a bigger idea, which is emotional intelligence. EQ, this is all about EQ. You notice what's not on this map. Being the tallest, the mightiest, the smartest, none of those things are part of the map of I'm a successful leader in the 21st century. But emotional intelligence is all over the map, right? Something very important. So quiet confidence. Quiet confidence is a tall order. To be quietly confident means a tremendous amount of self-awareness, a tremendous amount of having mastered, understood one's emotions and one's values as a person and as an organization. Right? Self-examination is the predecessor or the precondition to quiet confidence. And if you notice, if you look at this map structurally, everything winds up at quiet confidence before it starts to replicate again. If you look at that meme, unencumbered, new style, trust and trust and quiet confidence is the last stop on the journey before we start the replication process. It is the apex, so to speak, of this map. And it's the one that I find the most fascinating. And again, requires the most self-work on the part of a leader. Next. And last but not least, I already mentioned, this is very much about service leadership. It's not all about me. It is all about us. It's a good way to put it. It's all about us. It's not all about me. And the leaders that we admire, there is a remarkable, they call it a paradox, between their humility, meaning the self-effacing, their egos virtually disappear, and yet huge confidence and ambition. Right? And it's not paradoxical if you look at it underneath the surface. If you're in service to a big idea, it will present itself as a weird combination of humility and huge confidence and vision. And that's what we want. Right? That's what's called a level five leader, according to that uh, paradigm. Next. We just wanted to play a little game with you or stimulate you with uh, some images. 
which type of leader are you? There are three options that you have, archetypally speaking, and then one meme. So we thought, what are some examples? And these are all up for, for debate. You will come up with some of your own. Let's start with the first one, intuitive anthropologist. Right? To understand is the key here. And so we have, you could just click slowly. We've got people like Deepak Chopra, the Dalai Lama, Churchill, that's Jane Goodall up there, actually, who helped us understand ourselves by looking at a similar species, chimpanzees. Bill Clinton in his first term certainly was very good at this. And there's Margaret Mead who uh, very much changed the world with how she understood human behavior. And as a brand, Apple is one of the examples of the ability to intuit and to understand what people want before they can even put it into words. Okay. Next, to inspire. So here are some examples. Branson is an obvious one. I don't know uh, if you all probably know about Virgin Galactic and his space station, etc. He has Philippe Stark already has designed the terminal. It's, uh, it's quite something. Uh, you've got John Lasseter, who is the head of Pixar, who is basically educating an entire generation of boys in moral values through his stories. If you think about it, all of Pixar's stories are moral tales for young boys. Up, Cars, Toy Story, you name it. So without us quite knowing it, he's actually educating our children. Steve Jobs, obviously, and, and Apple, uh, truly an inspiring brand, and I think for the fifth year in a row, the most admired company in the world. Albert Einstein, his uh, famous quote, he said, imagination is more important than math. Imagination to a scientist is more important than the technical aspects. Of course you have to know the technical aspects, but to imagine something different is key. Walt Disney inspired us to today, Southwest Airlines as a brand, and there are many, many more examples of how to inspire and give us a vision of something into the future. Next, and to nurture, this one uh, that I think actually is the most important. If you look at the structure of the map, this is a direct access point into the meme. It's like you go right into the meme from here. You have the obvious example of Mother, Mother Teresa, but you don't have to be a Mother Teresa to be this type. You've got Bill and Melinda Gates. Bill, chapter two, was nurturing. Chapter one, not so much. Right? <laughs> There's uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, a huge proponent of human rights. There is uh, George Soros and the Open Society Institute and his incredible uh, uh, works of compassion around the world. There is Mahatma Gandhi, of course. And as a brand, there's one that's very known for this kind of thing, and that's Johnson & Johnson. And in fact, Johnson & Johnson uh, approached the Tylenol scare was in an intuitive and, and nurturing manner. So as a leader, uh, perfection is not possible. You're, we are going to make mistakes. It is the manner in which we address them that reveal what type of leader we are. So there is the meme or meme system of leadership. There are your three types. I think I did this faster than you even wanted. Do we have time for questions, thoughts? No? <laughs> I'm done, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.